don't know me, and I'm the president of the Hearing Loss Association of America, the Diablo Valley chapter, which is in Walnut Creek, California. Before we start, we'd like to ask that everybody who's from a different state than California, rename yourself, and after your name, just go ahead and put what state you're from. And so if you don't know how to rename yourself, if you drag your cursor over your thumbnail in the upper right-hand corner, uh, a little, uh, I think it's lines come up, just click on that and it says rename and you can add your state. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to take care of that. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna let you know that Prior to our presentation about cochlear implants today from Kurt Kramer, we give directions on how to use Zoom. So video conferencing has been, in my opinion, the best, since, best thing since sliced bread for all of us with hearing loss. We're able to read everybody's lips. We have captions. We can see the captions for what we're missing. And so we wanna make sure that everybody gets up to speed on how to use Zoom. Some of us are old pros by this point, but others are just really kind of getting into the swing of things. And Zoom also keeps changing um, its functions, adding new things and, and removing them. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, oh, excuse me, before I do that, we have board members here who work behind the scenes on all of our meetings to ensure that they run smoothly, and I'd like to acknowledge them. So, Zohar Chiba, I saw that you joined us, and Zohar is our vice president. Can you just say hello? Linda Sorry, Pinto. I was on mute. Hello. Bye. Hi there. Welcome. Thanks, O'Hare. Alan Katsur is our secretary. Alan, can you say, and tech guy behind the scenes all around my right-hand person. Good morning, everyone. And is Walt here? I know he's I, ha I haven't seen him. Okay, so our treasurer isn't here, so I can't introduce him. So now I'm going to go ahead and start our directions for Zoom. So before um, Kurt goes ahead and gets started, is everybody have their captions turned on and is everybody able to hear and comfortable? Because this is really a very important presentation for all of us who are here. So everybody's good. Okay, before I introduce Kurt, I'd like to let everybody know that I'm a UCSF patient. I have two cochlear implant, two very successful cochlear implants um, that I had done at UCSF. And there are two um, CI audiologists. Kurt doesn't happen to be my audiologist, but I am uh, acquainted with him. So Kurt, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. And do you want to um, share a presentation or did you wanna just talk? Um, I have a presentation um, to Perfect. share. I will go through it mostly, but you know, if we questions get off, the presentation, we can answer the questions. So feel free to answer questions yeah. whenever. So Kurt, we need to go ahead and make you a co-host so you can share. Okay, you can go ahead and share your screen. And could you share your video so that we can um, lip read you? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I can hear you fine. Okay. Right. And you don't see me yet? No, I don't see you. Oh, let's see here. Ah, there we go. You're coming down. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for having me um, to your meeting. I see some familiar faces. I see a few people that are a little overdue to come see me as well. Donna and Susan, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the introduction, Anne. Let me pull up my screen here. Okay, there's this. 
And share, okay. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so once again, my name is Kurt Kramer. Um, I work at UCSF Cochlear Implant Center um, in San Francisco. I've been at UCSF for about um, 13 years. And out of those 13 years, I've been doing cochlear implants solely full-time for the 12 years. Um, and like Ann said, I do know her. She's come with a couple of our recipients in the past. And then more recently, she got implanted herself. And today I'm just going to talk to you about hearing loss, um, audiology, and the treatment um, for it. And like I said, I'm going to go through the slide. Um, I'm not committed to it. So if you have questions, just feel free to ask, okay? Okay. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I'm a little rusty with PowerPoint. Okay, so let's talk about hearing loss. Um, as you know, um, I, you know, there's a large group here in the meeting, and about 15% of the American population over 18 has some difficulty with hearing. And then as people age, um, the hearing loss becomes a little bit more uh, disabling. And you can see here about 2% of adults um, between Kurt, 45. Before you go on, can I ask you to start the slideshow? So we only see the um, slides you're talking about. What's happening here? If you hit the F5 key, it should go to slideshow. Yeah, it's not working. See in your menu bar, it says slideshow. Mm. So file, home, insert, draw, design, transition, animation, slideshow. I don't see that. It's so bizarre. Are you showing yours full screen? Yeah. Okay, so take it out of full screen, start the slideshow, and then come back. So quit sharing, put it in a show, slideshow, then share it. Oh, that's what I, let's see, there we go. I apologize for this. There you go. All right. Are we back in business? Yeah. And on your side, Kurt, I think you should see in the bottom left-hand corner, you can advance the slides there or just use your um, arrows or um, mouse or your glide path. I've never seen it do this before. Okay. So when you share that screen, sometimes you need to click on the screen to make sure it knows the screen is active. See, now we're into the uh, sorter or out of the slideshow. There we go. Perfect. Okay, thank you for that. Uh -huh. Sorry about the technical difficulties. So as I was saying, as people get older, there's this more and more disabling hearing loss. Um, which it can be costly on many levels, opportunity cost, um, psychological costs of this. And it's something that really needs to be addressed. And to be honest with you, in my last decade plus of working with um, hearing aids and cochlear implants and cochlear implants, especially, it's been really great to see how 
much more people do know about cochlear implants coming into the clinic. You know, when I first was starting out in this, a lot of my uh, recipients or candidates would come in not even knowing that it required a surgery. So it can be, you know, I, as these coming to these meetings and these hearing loss groups, it's just been really nice. The recipients and candidates are coming to the clinic with more knowledge based on certain treatments, hearing aids, and when to get out of hearing aids and start looking into the cochlear implant space. So I want to talk about types of hearing loss first. I'm going to kind of just breeze through this because um, two of them don't really apply to the cochlear implant scene. But there's one type of hearing loss is conductive hearing loss. And then the most common one um, and what we're going to be focusing on today is the sensory neural hearing loss. And then lastly, there's a combination of both of them. Um, sometimes uh, you can have a problem getting the sound to the cochlea and then a problem with the cochlea itself, which causes a mixed hearing loss between the two. And there's different treatments for all of these kinds of um, hearing losses. So a conductive hearing loss is when the problem is conducting the sound waves anywhere through the route of the ear from the pinna all the way through the eardrum and the middle ear bones, which are called the ossicles. And the most common causes of uh, conductive hearing loss is um, earwax impaction, um, where the ear canals get full of wax and can actually become solid and block any sound from passing through. Um, another one, especially in children, is uh, middle ear infections. And then people who have these middle ear infections with fluid and um, that are chronic over time, a lot of those ears can then develop what is called the cholesteatoma, which is like a benign mass or tumor in the ear that is behind the eardrum and it can erode the middle ear bones. Then you got um, sensory neural hearing loss, and that is more of what a permanent hearing loss. Um, and that is the cause of the hearing loss is somewhere in the cochlea in the inner ear or in the cochlear nerve. And sometimes it's hard to tell exactly where that hearing loss is. So that's why it's called sensory neural, sensory being the cochlea, neural being the nerve. And so um, there's certain hearing losses that we can kind of tell where they are located and um, where the uh, pathology is, but a lot of times we don't really know. And as you can see, sensory neural hearing loss accounts for about 90% of all that hearing loss um, that I had talked about earlier. And then you have some common causes of the hearing losses, um, genetics, um, fam familial trends. Um, a lot of, I see some people who, you know, they start losing their hearing in their 20s and 30s, and then they get their hearing aids and cochlear implants. And as their kids age around the same time in the 20s, they start having hearing loss too. And another one that you guys are all probably familiar with is Meniere's. And then something a little bit more severe is the acoustic neuroma, which is actually another benign tumor, but instead of in the middle ear space, like a cholesteatoma, it, it occurs on the um, auditory nerve coming out of the, uh, from the cochlea. And then the most common kind of hearing loss is uh, related to aging, and that's called presbycusis. And then lastly, ototoxic drugs. So some drugs that people need for uh, treatments of cancers or really severe infections. And they need to have um, a lot of antibiotics that are very strong to treat these things. And the chemotherapy drugs, they can actually wipe out your hearing and uh, cause sensory neural hearing loss. And then lastly, this mixed hearing loss. And this is the combination of both the permanent sensory neural hearing loss and then the conduction. And some of the causes of this um, the a very common one is otosclerosis. That's actually um, bony growth on the middle ear bones. So what happens is with that bony growth, it doesn't, when the sound wave hits the eardrum and it tries to send the um, motion through the bones because the ear bones are surrounded in extra bone, they don't move and you can't get the sound to the cochlea. And then another uh, thing that some people get for mixed hearing losses is uh, the balance organ is comprised of the hearing organs comprised of two things, the hearing and the balance. And in some of those balance organs, you can have like an opening in it and it's called a, a semicircular canal dehiscence, which is a little hole, which can cause a mixed hearing loss. So before we go into treatment and where these hearing losses occur, I just want to just do a brief overview of the ear. On um, the outer ear, the pinna, 
and then it goes down through the ear canal and eardrum. And then those are the three little bones there in the middle that I was speaking of. And then the blue organ there is the cochlea. And you can see the cochlea looks like the snail shape and the three circular canals are um, the balance organ. So the cochlea is comprised, like I said, of the hearing and balance. And then you have the auditory nerve that supplies both of the hearing and balance organs. So when we're talking about a conductive hearing loss, the conductive pathology is somewhere in that ear canal, outer ear, or the middle ear. That's where the pathology lies. And then we're talking about a sensory neural hearing loss. It's here in the cochlea or the auditory nerve. So I just want to review audiograms. I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with audiograms. I'm sure you all have had multiple hearing tests before. But the audiogram is measuring um, pitch, frequencies, and soft and loud sounds. So if you start in the upper left, um, that is very soft and as in a very low pitch. And as you go to the right, the frequencies increase and you get more higher pitches that we're testing. And then as you go down, it's the louder the sound. So in an audiogram, we're measuring from negative 10 decibels to 120 decibels. And you can kind of see the uh, categories of hearing loss here. Anything above 20 decibels is considered normal hearing. The further you go down on the audiogram, the worse the hearing loss is. And then here, something you're probably familiar with, the red circles and blue Xs, that's for, red circles is for the right ear. We uh, always remember red right, it's the easiest thing. And in my profession, we do switch ears a lot. It's one of the common mistakes that we make, even though we've been doing it every day for many years. Um, but the blue Xs are the left and the red circles are the right ear. And as you can see, this is a normal hearing audiogram. And when we test hearing, we mostly test between 125 hertz and 8,000 hertz because, um, because that is the most important frequencies for speech. And for humans, it's communication, and that's why we are looking at those frequencies. Now, when some people go through cancer treatments and they get on those ototoxic drugs, we can test up to 20,000 hertz, which is the highest the human ear can hear. Um, when, you when people start these ototoxic drugs, the high freak, high, ultra high frequencies tend to go away first. So that's something we do monitor when people are on those ototoxic drugs. But for like cochlear implants, we're looking at this 125 Hertz to 8,000 Hertz range. And then here's just a typical mild flat hearing loss. And then Conversely, all the way down here at the bottom, this is definitely cochlear implant candidacy range, um, a profound hearing loss in both ears. And then I wanna show you, this is probably a more common type of hearing loss, especially as people age. And in the low frequencies, they have pretty good hearing. And then as the high frequencies um, uh, go on, you have more and more hearing loss. Um, this is most likely related to how the cochlea is set up. Your cochlea is organized uh, by uh, pitch. So at the entrance of the cochlea, you hear 20,000 Hertz. And as it curls around two and a half times, you go all the way down to 20 Hertz. And so at every sound wave that comes in, whether it's a low frequency or high frequency is passing the entrance to the cochlea. So that's why you see a lot of high frequency hearing losses. And this is something a lot of people say, I can hear, but I can't understand. And I'm gonna show you why. So this is a familiar sound. Um, and the pink line here is called the speech banana. And I don't know if you can see it too well, but you see all of the English uh, letters and phonemes that is in the English language. And you can see where they lie based on the frequencies they have and how loud they are. So one thing I always tell my recipients and candidates in the cochlear implant clinic is um, like for instance, in English, the consonants are very important for speech understanding. Um, they give a lot of meaning to words. So F, S, T, H, S, H, T, K. These are all high frequency sounds that give a lot of meaning to words. And then you go down to the lower end and you have your vowels, A, E, I, O, and U. The vowels in the English language carry the volume of speech. Whereas conversely, like French speaking, the vowels are much more important in French than the consonants are. 
So then this is a sloping hearing loss. The circles are the right ear. That once again, the X's are the left. And as the hearing loss slopes, you can kind of track this. And you can do this with your own audiogram if you have a copy. As you anything above the hearing loss, um, X's and O's, the person would not be able to hear without intervention. So you can kind of see what you're missing when you have a certain kind of hearing loss. And this is another version of that. So like you can see here, the T, F, T, H, S, and K, they are not heard by this person with this hearing loss um, without any intervention or increasing the volume. And so when we're looking at pitch and frequencies, that's one component of what we're testing. The other component that is important here is the word recognition score. If you see up top, and so you see this person here has what I would say a mild to moderately severe hearing loss. But when we turn um, the volume up to 70 decibels, so make it loud enough for this person to hear, their word recognition scores isn't too bad. So they have, they have a significant hearing loss here, but with audibility, they do pretty well in understanding speech. So this is a very important thing when it comes to cochlear implant. When we from, when we review cases coming in, what I look at is not only the detection thresholds of the X's and O's of where they fall on the audiogram, but it's the word understanding. And so if you have a good word understanding, uh, word recognition score, it is a good indication that hearing aids will be very successful for you. Get some hearing aids on, provide some audibility, and you should be able to do pretty well. Then conversely is if the word recon recognition score is poor, hearing aids probably won't work or aren't really indicated, but we would try them to see if they do help, but then we have to look at something else to help the hearing loss because that's probably more of a distortion in the nerve than anything that we can um, take care of just by increasing audibility of the sound. Okay. So there's different treatments for the different kinds of hearing losses. For conductive um, hearing loss treatment, um, it's typically done with medical intervention. Um, some of these hearing losses are temporary. Some of them can be chronic. But for instance, I mentioned having um, middle ear fluid or an ear infection. A lot of times what doctors will do, and this can be done in the clinic, um, in the doctor's office, they'll just cut a little hole in your eardrum and they'll put a little tube to help aerate the middle ear space and let that fluid drain out. And a lot of times that relieves that hearing loss right away. And then when it comes to that uh, cholesteatoma or the masses in the middle ear, what they do is go in and they can remove that surgically. And then lastly, some people are born without an ear. Um, some people just have chronic conductive hearing loss that can't be managed uh, surgically. So um, there's a device called a Baja hearing device. It's another type of ear implant. It is not a cochlear implant. It actually is embedded in the skull and it vibrates the skull with the sound processor connected. And what it's doing is bypassing that outer ear and the middle ear and it's stimulating the cochlea directly. And then let's talk about some basic uh, sensory neural uh, hearing loss treatments. So some people come in with fluctuating hearing loss or a sudden sensory neural hearing loss where they wake up one day and they had no hearing. I um, mean, in those uh, treat in those cases, it's usually treated with steroid, um, either orally or through injections into the eardrum. And then um, in those cases of the acoustic neuromas, they can have to cut the nerve or remove the um, remove the tumor off the auditory nerve. And sometimes you just have to sacrifice the ear when you're doing that based on how big that neuroma is. And a lot of times people do that because the acoustic neuroma is causing them constant dizziness. And you know it's very debilitating. So they have to go through an extreme case of going through surgery and getting that removed. But what do you think is the most common form of treatment for sensory neural hearing loss? Let's see if anyone's here in the chat. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Okay. 
it's hearing aids. And it looks like I see some hearing aids in this group. I know some of my, I see some of my recipients have cochlear implants, but hearing aids is the most common. And we definitely encourage trying hearing aids before moving into the cochlear implant space. Um, hearing aids work uh, by picking up sound through a microphone. The signal is passed on to the amplifier and then the receiver sends the signal to the ear. So as you can see here, the hearing aid is in the ear. This is a in the canal hearing aid. And it goes to the ear canal and it hits the eardrum and it sends the sound wave through the cochlea up to the nerve. And here's some different styles of hearing aids that you're all probably pretty familiar with. You got in the ear, you got CIC in the canal ones, you got the behind the ear. And more common these days is what this uh, receiver in the canal, it's called a RIC, R-I-C. Those are what usually I'm seeing most often these days. So for hearing aids, they have channels or frequency bands um, to individually fine tune where your hearing loss is and address the hearing loss at certain frequencies. So we have handles on the hearing aid programming software to adjust accordingly. And then also has algorithms in there for noise reduction and directional microphones for helping hearing and noise. But there's some limitations to uh, hearing aids. Some people have problems with sensitive skin or sensitive ears, or they have a hole in their eardrum that hasn't closed and they can get it can get wet and it can get infected and you know they are allergic to hearing aids. So some people just can't even wear them. Um, and then once you get to a certain level of hearing loss, hearing aids become non-functional for you because you are only working with the system you have with hearing aids. So if your system is beyond damage, you've got a lot of neural hearing loss or a lot of hair cell hearing loss in the um, cochlea, the, co the hearing aids won't work for you. So that's when we go into cochlear implants. So essentially it's when hearing aids aren't cutting in it anymore. And this is when you come into our clinic, this is what we're assessing. You know, we test your hearing and then we'll check your hearing aids um, to see if they're fit appropriately for your hearing loss. And um, if it's not, then we have our clinic aids that will fit for you and just make sure that you're getting the audibility out of the hearing aids. And then we do the speech testing and that's kind of helps us determine if we're gonna move forward with the cochlear implant. Cochlear implants are indicated for people who have poor word recognition ability when the sound is loud enough for them to hear. And what's different about cochlear implants than hearing aids is it's hearing aids is acoustic sound. It's how we hear through our ear without any hearing aids. Hearing aids just pick up the sound acoustically and go through the uh, microphones and then you get, a, you get a lot of amplification. Whereas a cochlear implant, it's actually bypassing the ear and it's actually sending electrical pulses to the auditory nerve. So there's two main components to a cochlear implant. On the left here is the external sound processor. As you can see, it's a little bit larger than a typical uh, behind the ear hearing aid. It comprises of all the things that hearing aids have, directional microphones, um, frequency channels in there. Um, and the, when you, the one big difference of a speech processor compared to a hearing aid is the um, coil which you can see is connected to a wire to the sound processor. And that coil has a magnet in it, then it connects to the, the implant, which is on the right. That's the piece that is embedded under the uh, skin on top of the skull. It's not brain surgery, but the surgeon will place this implant. And in the center of that circle of the implant is a magnet. And that's how the processor connects to the implant. And the processor tells the implant what to do um, via a radio frequency signal and then the implant will fire. So as before with the hearing aid, you the hearing aid sat in the ear canal, but now with the cochlear implant, you can see the coil up there in the top left connected to the implant on the inside. And then that wire goes through the uh, bone behind your ear. If you touch that bone, all of you right now, that's actually the hardest bone in your body. And that's because it's protecting your cochlea. So when the when you get it, when the surgeon goes in, they drill the little hole in that bone, and then they fill put the wire in behind the eardrum, and you can see the wire then is inserted into the cochlea um, in about two and a half turns. 
So I want to talk about candidacy because I know that was kind of important. And what I'm showing you here is what is called, I would say, traditional cochlear implant candidacy. So people, um, most insurances, um, now including uh, Medicare, they've all aligned. Medicare used to have separate rules for candidacy than private insurances, but, but all of the insurances now uh, say that you need to have moderate to profound hearing loss in both ears. And so if you have your audiogram, you can kind of track where your, uh, where your symbols fall to see if you qualify for a cochlear implant using this basic graph. Now, there's a lot of exceptions to this rule. Some people have hearing loss in one ear only that's profoundly deaf and have a normal hearing ear. And we started implanting those ears probably about, I think it was in 2015. So it's technically not approved for, cochlear implants aren't approved technically up until last year, I think, for single-sided hearing loss, but that's just another kind of candidacy. So just because you don't necessarily have a moderate to profound, to profound hearing loss doesn't mean you won't qualify for a cochlear implant because there's a lot of off-label things that we can do to get a cochlear implant for certain types of hearing losses. So when you come into our clinic, we um, do some testing and to qualify you for a cochlear implant, um, see if you can receive one. And the main thing is, is insurances state that you have to have less than 60% uh, sentence score. So we present sentences in quiet and noise sometimes. And to get people to qualify, they have to do less than 60%. Medicare, up until I believe four or five months ago, they required um, less than 40%. So that was a very limiting factor for, you know, the biggest group of people, most of them who, you know, most of our population are on Medicare. And so for them to qualify for a cochlear implant, they needed to have a score of 40% or less. And that's really bad hearing. So there's a big chunk of those people who couldn't qualify for a cochlear implant, but were struggling a lot and hearing aids weren't cutting it for them. But a few months ago, Medicare caught up to private insurances and now it's less than 60%. So it's kind of opened up the candidacy and um, now more people can get access to a cochlear implant. Um, another um, criteria that you need is you have to have an auditory nerve. I know that sounds a little strange, but some people are born without a nerve and you have to have a nerve to stimulate for a cochlear implant. And if you don't have a nerve, there's nothing to stimulate so you can't get a cochlear implant. And you can't have any active ear infections. You're not having brain surgery when it comes to cochlear implant, but there is a lot of like uh, cranial fluid in there. And so we have to have free of, of infection before we go and put an implant. So some people who have those chronic um, holes in their eardrum, um, they have constant infections and then it's affected their hearing to the point where they do need a cochlear implant. Oftentimes the surgeons will do a two-step process. They will go into the ear, they will clean up the infection, and then they actually close off the ear, remove like the eardrum. And that what, what happens with that is then it frees up the ear from infection. And then after they heal from that first surgery, they go in a few months later and they get their cochlear implant. And now, um, as of last year or year before, it used to be 12 months or older to get a cochlear implant. Now they reduce that to nine months. So a lot of these uh, babies who are born with significant profound hearing loss have access to cochlear implants at an earlier age. And the earlier you get implanted for children, the better your language development will occur. And then lastly, um, a lot of times people have other uh, medical conditions. And so a lot of times we have to get authorization from the primary care physician or a cardiologist to make sure that they can with, um, undergo surgery and withstand anesthesia. So if you come into the clinic for our testing, there's what is called the minimum speech test battery. Now you go to Stanford, you go to UCSF or Kaiser, wherever across the country, people should be using these basic tests because our, our field came together um, about, I think it was revised the last time in 2011. 
And there's two types of testing. CNC testing, which is one syllable words. It's two consonants and one vowel. And then we do AZ bio sentences. It's four speakers, two male and two female speakers. And when we do that testing, it's completed at 60 dB decibels. A lot of times people are like, can you turn it up? I just need it a little bit louder. But we cannot do that when we're testing because we're using a standardized um, platform to determine candidacy. So we can't make things louder. So preoperatively, we test at 60 dB. Postoperatively, for outcomes, we also test at 60 dB. So why a cochlear implant over a hearing aid? By the time people get to me and um, are looking for a cochlear implant, it's that they've usually tried hearing aids and it's just not cutting it. The distortion, the hearing aid just causes more distortion that's louder. So with cochlear implants, it provides clearer sound quality, improved speech understanding, and uh, less listening effort, and overall just better access to sound. But there's some things to consider. You're putting a wire down in your ear for, uh, when you get a cochlear implant. So in doing that, it's a foreign object in your body. So what happens is your body sends the immune system to your ear and it tries to seal off the cochlear implant from the body because it thinks it's under attack. And in doing that, you get scar tissue after surgery. And as a result, if you had any residual hearing, it's usually significantly uh, lowered or completely gone after surgery. Cochlear implants are also not normal hearing. It's a great tool, but the average performance with on the single words with the cochlear implant is 50%. And that has kind of been the that has kind of been the standard since probably the late 90s to early 2000s. And then what our clinic did at UCSF, we did because you don't see much data in the research about performance anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what our clinic did just to check in to see what is the current state of cochlear implants. And um, we assessed all of our clinic data and all of our patients who got implanted from 2015 to the first part of 2020. So many, many years of data. And we found the same thing. No matter the company, the device of cochlear implant, the average score on single words is about 50%. So it's an average, meaning some people do a lot better. Some people do a lot worse but it's, it's not normal hearing. And then another thing for cochlear implants is having a magnet in your head, and that can be limiting for MRIs. Now, as of a few years ago, all three of the cochlear implant companies um, have a cochlear implant that is capable to get an, um, undergo an MRI. There's some conditions based on the device you have to be able to do so. But you know, up until 2015, it wasn't really possible to get an MRI, which is important for as people age. There's a lot of conditions that you know diagnostic MRIs are a very beneficial tool. And a lot of times, if it was serious enough, people would have to go in and get the magnet removed from their cochlear implant before getting the MRI. And then another limitation and a barrier, and it's a big one, is just cochlear implant programs, they usually run at a loss. And so small practices can't do cochlear implants. And so all the centers tend to be in big medical centers, which happen to be in urban areas. You know, and UCSF, we serve all the way up from the Oregon border, all the way down to Fresno, essentially. So that's a wide range. But a lot that's very hard for people to get to from those areas. So let's talk about the three companies of cochlear implants. There was a fourth, but cochlear bought it out. Um, Oticon, I don't know if any of you have an Oticon hearing aid. Oticon was going to come to market with a cochlear implant, but then cochlear bought them last July, I believe. So there's three companies, Advanced Bionics. It's located just down Interstate 5, just north of Los Angeles, right across the street from uh, Magic Mountain Theme Park. Then you got Co Cochlear Corporation. They're based out of Sydney, Australia. Their U.S. office is uh, in Denver, Colorado. And then lastly, Medel. Medel is based off of Innsbruck, Austria, and their uh, U.S. base is in North Carolina. So here is 
advanced bionics in the upper left here is the Naida M90. Um, it was released, I believe, in the spring of 2021. And you see their implant there. And then a Roger disc and a mini mic accessory to help here in noisy situations, to help here at church. If you go to a lecture, these are just some accessories you can use with the advanced bionic system to help hear better. And then we got cochlear. And there's something different here with cochlear. They have two type of processors. They have the standard um, behind the ear processor with the coil up to the head, as you can see on the left. But then they have a, what's called an off the ear processor. And that's in the middle there. It's called the Canso 2. That piece actually just sits on top of your head here with nothing on your ear. And with the pandemic happening and all the masking that's been going on, people have been really liking these off the ear options because, you know, a lot of times you have glasses, you have other things behind your ear, you have, then you have to put a mask on and people take those masks off and they, they lose their cochlear implant processor. These off the ear processes have been really beneficial for some of these people um, during the pandemic phase. And then similar to cochlear, Medel has the behind the ear processor and a button processor off the ear. So these are your basic components of cochlear implant system across the three companies. So how do you know if you're a cochlear implant candidate? So think to yourself, even with hearing aids, do people say you're talking too loud? Is your TV really loud? Um, does it take multiple attempts to get your attention? Um, do you have to actually someone come and touch you to get your attention? Um, and the biggest one here, and it's actually one of the saddest things I see, and then it's also one of the most rewarding things I see on the back end of a cochlear implant, is I see people starting to regress from social situations. I had people who like to volunteer and they stop volunteering and they all of a sudden become reclusive over a course of years and then depression sets in. And I've actually seen people come get a cochlear implant and that has allowed them to get back engaged in the activities they like to do. And I can see the turnaround. And it's like one of the most rewarding parts of my job, actually, is to see how these cochlear implants can really benefit and get people back out to doing meaningful things and establishing meaningful relationships. So if you think you're a candidate, you can come see me or my colleague, uh, Dr. Colleen Polite. There's two of us audiologists at UCSF that do cochlear implants strictly. And we currently have two adult surgeons. Um, we're located in the middle of San Francisco on Sutter Street. You can see our email there and our phone number. And I can get this information to Anne. I think Anne already has it and she can disseminate it to you if you would like, if you're interested in or you think you qualify for a cochlear implant, we can start that evaluation. That's all I have for my slideshow. I can have some time for questions. Okay, everybody, click on the smiley face with the reactions for your questions. Diane Bishop from Pennsylvania. Make sure to mute yourself. Okay. I mean, um, unmute yourself. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, are you familiar with um, auditory hallucinations or musical ear syndrome? And do you know if getting a cochlear implant um, helps that situation? Um, I'm vaguely familiar with it. I have a few uh, patients that have um, various songs on loop in their ear, like it's a form of tinnitus but they do have a cochlear implant and that still exists for them when they're not wearing their cochlear implant. So usually with these cases, like the auditory hallucinations or that musical ear or just general tinnitus in and of itself, when they put the cochlear implant on, it's providing the ear with some stimulation, which then will suppress those hallucinations or the music or the tinnitus. But when they take it off, it returns sometimes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark Goldenberg. Uh, yes, um, the implant in that's implanted under the skull behind the ear, how is that device powered? Is it powered by the body or is it powered by way of the transmitter? So the there's, processor? 
Good question. Um, so the all the power is done externally through a rechargeable battery on the external processor. So there's no power supply internally on the cochlear implant. It's all done on that behind the ear or the button processor off the ear. There's the power supply is a rechargeable battery typically. Okay, so it's essentially wireless charging by way of the transmitter. Yes. Okay, that, that's what I suspected, but I in all of my research, I hadn't found anything that explained how the internal device was powered because obviously it's got to have power if it's going to transmit electrical impulses to the nerve. Exactly, and so that's why cochlear implants are larger than hearing aids because the demands of a cochlear implant, it's doing so much more. You're actually driving current. And that was one of the limitations when cochlear implants first came out, when they were under development, like in the 60s and 70s, the first cochlear implants, the processor was actually in a box that the people had to carry around because the power supply was so immense. It, you needed a big battery. So over the years, it wasn't until like 2000, so just about two decades ago, where these processors got small enough to be put on your ear because the battery improvement got to the point where the processors would get smaller. And that's always a limiting factor. Like right now, Cochlear is brand is the smallest processor on the market. And it's because they found a battery that's small enough to power their system. So as the battery technology improves, the processors will continue to get smaller. Jonathan Patton. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, kind of, I've got a few questions. Uh, just going off of that last one, though, how are they replaceable batteries? It sounds like they're rechargeable batteries that are used. Yep. So most of the systems with the three companies, you'll get at least two rechargeable batteries and a charger. And then all of them do come with disposable batteries that you can use in the event that you don't, you're not, you're in a place without electricity. So there is an option to use disposable batteries, but versus like a hearing aid, people use one battery in their hearing aid. These cochlear implants require two large 675 batteries to power the system. And how long does they, how long do they last between charges? So a standard rechargeable battery should get you through one day of use, which is typically anywhere between 12 and 16 hours because people don't wear it while they sleep. So assuming you're sleeping for about eight hours, a full day is about 16 hours and that would be really good battery life. Now, some people's ear anatomy and their cochlear implant have such high power demands that they don't get a full day of battery use and they have to switch their battery in the evening. But generally speaking, one battery should get you through a day and then you put it on the charger overnight. I see. Oh, it's interesting that they have rechargeable batteries that you can take out and regular hearing aids don't. Or not that I know of, anyway. Yeah, so actually hearing aids are, um, there are more and more companies are getting rechargeable hearing aids where it comes with like a little case or a stand that you put the hearing aids in. So the, it is getting away from the zinc air disposable batteries, which is good for the environment and a lot more cost effective over time. Right. But I was just thinking you have to send it in to get the battery replaced instead of you yes. changing it yourself. Um, and uh, Two other questions. I know cost is probably variable with your insurance, but typically if you have regular commercial insurance, do you can you say, is there like a an average of what it would cost out of pocket? It's so variable depending on the insurances. There's so many insurances. I can tell you right now, the whole surgery and the implant and the external processor, you'll get people get two processors when they first have surgery, one primary and then one for backup in the event their primary breaks. Surgery and all of that is billed at $180,000. And most people, I would say most people don't pay much more than $1,000 or so, generally speaking. But this is very dependent on what kind of insurance you have and what kind of deductibles you have and premiums and things like that. When it comes to Medicare, Medicare will cover 80% of the cochlear implant. And then a lot of people have a secondary insurance that will cover the last 20%. Okay. So some people pay no money at all. 
Uh -huh. Jonathan, I have Medicare and I have a Medicare Advantage plan and I paid $200 for the outpatient surgery just to use the surgery as a deductible and for each one of the appointments with the audiologist, <coughs> it was $15 per appointment. So very wow. minimal. Yeah, that's good. And then and it's, considered, it's considered a different kind of medical device. And I don't know if you've been reading about the news, but Medicare doesn't cover ears, ears, eyes, or teeth, right? And so they're trying to work and change that because it's such a huge need and hearing loss is such an impactful disorder that many people who are on Medicare have. Um, but right as it stands now, Medicare doesn't cover hearing aids. But when you get to this point of needing a cochlear <coughs> implant, um, it's Medicare will cover that. Uh -huh. uh, and then another question, I've, I've heard, con not conflict, yeah, conflicting, comments about how they work so well in noisy environments and other people saying they're kind of like hearing aids. They, they help, but they don't work that well. Uh, is there? I, I would say generally that I see them help more in noise than hearing aids do. Um, hearing and noise is challenging for everyone. And then it gets more difficult as hearing loss uh, increases, but with cochlear implants and now the algorithms and the, pro the processing that they have, I'm finding, especially with the new advanced bionics one, and now cochlear has a new one coming out. Um, these directional microphones on the cochlear implants have progressed to a point where it is very beneficial in hearing and noise. But like, so for instance, the word scores, and I see down here in chat, someone mentioned this. So the outcome of a cochlear implant, when we test those individual words that I mentioned, and when I, and when we test the sentences, the average score with a cochlear implant is at 50% on the individual words. And then um, the average score on the sentences is about 60%. And then what we do after that is we test you in quiet, say you do average 60%, we'll put in some noise, which is about five decibels lower than the speech. So it's the speech is still a little bit louder, but there's a lot of background noise. When you put in the next level of noise, you usually see a 20% drop from your score in quiet. So okay. you do get degraded performance, but at the same time, you still can hear a noise. Okay. And then my last, I can think of more, but I know a lot of people are asking or have their hands up. So I'll make this my last question. Uh, I was listening to something a couple of days ago about how they're putting something on the, the wire that can stimulate hair growth. I don't, I don't know if that's experimental or that's, or what. Can, yeah, so that's in the that. hair growth re, uh, regeneration um, studies. It's not currently commercially available. That's just in the research phase right now. And that's what they're trying to do is get to the point where when you get to these damaged hair cells in your cochlea, and that's where it's causing your hearing loss, a cochlear implant bypasses that. But what the research is really working on right now is delivering um, these treatments um, and medicines into the cochlea to regrow those hair cells. So in the future, hopefully we won't need cochlear implants because they can regrow the hair cells. But that is very much in the research phase. I think they're just starting human trials at a couple of centers in the US, um, but we're really far off from that being a possibility. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Great questions, thank you. Okay, Brian. Fikima, is that how you pronounce your last name? Uh, Flickima. Thank you. And I, you know, I think you just answered a couple of my questions. Um, so it's about 60 and 40% on average on word, 60% not noise, 40% in noise. So like for sentence testing um, with the, the two male and two female speaker tests that we use, the average score in quiet is about 60%. And then we do the first level of noise and we typically see about a 20 to 25% drop from the score in quiet. And then as you put more and more noise in, I mean, we can put more and more noise in and get you to perform at zero, but there's no point in testing that. But yes, you usually see about 25% drop um, per round of noise. And I usually test in two different noise levels. Okay. Um, cause I'm, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out if I'm, I mean, I've been told I'm a candidate, but I'm so right on the line that nobody can tell me if it's going to actually 
make anything better. <laughs> See, that's um, when they, you know, like what I tell people, if they look at their audiogram and their word score on their audiogram, if your score is somewhere around 60, 70, like you're probably going to be not a candidate, but it's worth coming in to go through the initial part of the evaluation to see where you're at. If you are that borderline. Now I can tell you the borderline recipients of cochlear implants they don't have as much of a wow factor as someone who is completely deaf before they get implanted, right? Because they have some functional hearing. And so a lot of times we're taking a look at how much natural hearing do you have and how well are you doing on these speech tests? Because we want to maintain our natural hearing as long as possible. Um, so if you are that borderline, we'd like we take a look at your scores and how much residual hearing you do have, you know, if we don't want to risk that, we'd probably hold off and like reevaluate in like a year or so. Okay. Um, and that was my second question, because I've gotten so much conflicting things on this, on how much of your sound or how much do you actually keep? And I mean, I noticed like MedL even now has a cochlear implant hearing aid in one device. Mm -hmm. so, so is that just if you're if you happen to be lucky enough or <laughs> yeah I mean, so you... you know as kind of what i was talking about earlier by putting that implant down in your ear you're doing damage to your ear but some people have that really good low frequency hearing and the low frequencies are deep into your ear and as your cochlea curls around in those turns it actually is getting narrower so cochlear implants don't actually go to the end of the cochlea they can't get down in there so when you get a cochlear implant it's inserted and where it stops, you st it doesn't hit those low frequencies. So a lot of times people can maintain their low frequency hearing, but their high frequency hearing uh, disappears. And in that case, like you said, uh, Medel, well, all three of the companies now have a device where you stimulate the high frequencies electrically with a cochlear implant. And then it has a, a receiver in the canal wire attached to it where you can acoustically amplify the low frequencies and that's called hybrid hearing okay and is that i mean because i i have moderate severe to one kilohertz dropping sharply to profound but when i went into my surgeon he basically said i'd lose it all anyways and it wouldn't be worth yeah so if, about, you're, but. if you're at moderately severe to profound hearing loss you're consider your lowest frequencies we considered preserved hearing 25 dB hearing loss. So if you even lose 25 decibels of your hearing, that's considered preserved hearing. But for you in the moderately severe range, if you lost 20 decibels, it would put you in the profound range. So we, we would just electrically stimulate and you wouldn't really qualify for that acoustic um, hybrid hearing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Jack L Landon. Thank you. That was a good presentation. I learned quite a bit. My Thank question you. is, is um, overall success, what, what, are, what percentages are you seeing of, of people who come away, uh, not necessarily with that aha moment, but just much improved, and, and people who um, are kind of disappointed and, and aren't getting the results that you'd hope for? So it's a good question. It's, it's always a challenging one. Um, a lot of times we can parse out expectations of what we expect someone to do with a cochlear implant before they get implanted. So we kind of hedge that like, you know, people who have significant hearing loss for a long period of time, like say you've had hearing loss for once you get to 15 years of a completely deaf and ear without wearing a hearing aid, outcomes for a cochlear implant become um, very poor. And just because there's, it's that adage of, if you don't use it, you lose it. So we know these people who come to us and like, oh, I want a cochlear implant now, but they've been deaf for 20, 30 years. We, we counsel them, yes, you'll get sound, but will you get meaningful speech understanding? More than likely not. But in terms of people who have hearing loss, they wear their hearing aids, the hearing aids aren't cutting it for them anymore and get uh, implanted with cochlear implants. I would say about 90% of the people that I work with see a pretty big benefit. It's a lot of people that find benefit from their cochlear implant. And about 10% of people for 
various reasons. Um, sometimes it's just cosmetic and they don't like it on their ear. Um, some people, they don't, because it, it's not like a hearing aid. You put it in and you can hear. You're really retraining your brain. It's a, a totally new way of hearing. So in the beginning, it's noisy and it's mechanical and robotic. And some people can't tolerate that. So what they do is stop wearing it. By doing that, they never get adjusted to the cochlear implant. Like the first month of a cochlear implant um, after activation is very, very challenging. It's exciting, but it's also frustrating. Um, some people who can't get past that, then they don't wear it, and then they're frustrated with their experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jack, even though I'm really involved in the hearing loss community and I knew probably everything anybody could know about implants and everything else, you know, as a lay person, I was not prepared for what the sound was when I was activated. It felt like there were aliens talking to me that first month. So I'm just confirming what Kurt's saying. Uh, Jim, Schro Jim Schroeder. Yeah, um, I just had a couple of comments about some of the other questions. So first about uh, uh, costs. Um, I was first implanted in, in 2016. And what I found in terms of uh, out-of-pocket costs, there are a lot of a lot of things you have to do to prepare for um, implant. You have to get a, a at least back then. I know things may have changed. I had to get an MRI, and then I had to have um, some um, um, immunizations um, for um, I think it was pneumonia. Um, and, and some of those, some of those things, um, I actually had, um, co-pays that were substantial. And so, uh, that's where most of the out-of-pocket cost was the, uh, the, um, uh, like Anne, um, you know, just the, um, the, the surgery and, and all of that was mostly covered by, um, uh, insurance. And I had Medicare at the time and I still do. But um, so I just wanted to point out that there's a number of hoops you have to jump through. Uh, once you've been said, yeah, we were going to give you a cochlear implant, you have to go through to um, medically make sure that uh, uh, everything inside your ear is, is what, what's expected and, pre and preparing for, for the surgery. Um, Yeah, and, and I guess I, I guess that's all I had to say. Uh, um, anyway, John Gallagher. Got it. Okay. Hi. Thanks for the discussion. Uh, you touched on it a little bit. Would you please? Uh, uh, touch a little bit more on the post-op learning and adjustment that people have to do, number one. And number two, can you discuss what music is like to people who have had implants? <laughs> um, yes, I can. So like I said, the first month is very frustrating. Um, before, um, technology um, gave us access to a lot of rehabilitation tools. We would send people after we activate them to a speech therapist, actually, to do auditory verbal therapy with their cochlear implant. Now, there's so many tools available through the, each manufacturer. Um, there's apps on your phone and your iPads. Um, there's free programs online that we have people do um, for at least 30 minutes a day in that first month. The, I always say at least 30 minutes, but the more you do, the better it will be, especially in the beginning uh, parts. But there's a really good tool called Angel Sound. It's a free program on the computer. It's a free app on um, iPhones or iPads. Um, Cochlear has a program called Telephone with Confidence. Um, in each day, you just go to the website, you call a number, and every day there's a new um, list of words. There's a new passages. Each week is like one week it's sports related, and every day you call in a number, and it's all very different passages that you can follow along for auditory training using your phone. And then we always encourage people to listen to music for at least 10 minutes a day with cochlear implants. But if someone were to come to me saying they wanted a cochlear implant so they could hear and appreciate music, I would send them out the door. 
because cochlear implants are just not known for music appreciation. Now, what I find like anecdote, like clinically with my recipients is that it's kind of like this bell curve. On one end is some people who love music and they, they, they appreciate it. They can hear the melody. They really enjoy it. On the very other end, people hate music. It's actually just noise to them. It, it's, it doesn't make sense. It's not enjoyable. And in fact, it like bothers them because it impacts their ability to understand speech. And then the most majority of people, I would say, have some ability to appreciate music that they are very familiar with from their past, songs that they love, songs that are imprinted on you. So I always encourage people when they get their cochlear implant to start listening to songs they know by heart. So what it's going to sound so weird through the cochlear implant, but the brain's a wonderful tool and it has an auditory memory and it can fill in the gaps and can help the music appreciation. But when it comes to new music, most people don't like it with their cochlear implants. When, when, when people go to a, a concert or something like that, do they choose to turn off their cochlear implant while they're trying to listen to the, uh, uh, well, say concert? Um, most often than not, people do not. They wear their cochlear implant. You know, there's program settings that we can have to help um, music appreciation by making, you know, when we're processing music, we don't want to limit the sound and we don't want lots of processing on it. So there are music programs that we can put on the cochlear implant to make the sound more linear and have music be more robust. But ultimately, cochlear implants can hear the beat or the rhythm of music very well. And then the cochlear implants allow them to hear the lyrics better. Thank you. Thanks, John. Oh, hi, Julie Oslin. Thanks for joining us. You're next. All right. I, I, there's so many questions and thoughts I've had during this. Thank you very much. It's been really interesting. Um, I, I, first of all, I am a bimodal user. I have hearing aid and a cochlear implant. And I use the, the mini mic from uh, cochlear a lot. I refuse to give up my social life. We go out a lot. We have a lot of fun. We do things. And I have found that the telecoil and the mini mic have really, really made a big difference in my ability to enjoy things. So I wanted, you know, I want to just mention that telecoil thing because I know uh, Cochlear left that out of their off the ear uh, second generation. And that's really a shame. It's nice that the mini mic has it. But you got to charge that too. And all of a sudden you're traveling and you've got so many chargers that sometimes it's nice to be able to use regular batteries. But, but anyhow, that's been my experience. I was diagnosed with uh, progressive sensorineural bilateral hearing loss when I was 22. And that was a long time ago, uh, 1964. And so... It, I lived with that for a long time because I was told hearing aids wouldn't make a difference, wouldn't help me. I was just going to go deaf and I needed to learn to live with it. That was a long time ago. So I feel very blessed to have had the opportunity to have high quality hearing aids and the implant. Um, but I was fit with only one hearing aid when I was in my mid 30s. That's when I finally said I'm getting a hearing aid. And I went for all those years until 2015, and did not have, did not have a hearing aid in my right ear. It was just in my left ear, and I was struggling with it. But I was using a neck loop and a pocket talker, and I was doing everything I could. Um, I opted to let them do the CI on my unaided ear, but I was told, and I listened to wear a hearing aid on that unaided ear for two years and listen to audio books with a neck loop and the telecoil and everything. So I did that for two years. And then they did the CA, CI on that ear that had been unaided. And it's been just absolutely fabulous. I just, I can't say enough about it. I, I am so glad I did it. And um, I appreciate music. I have a granddaughter who is a vocalist and, but you are right, if the music is familiar, 
it's much easier to enjoy it. And if it's not, you have to listen to it several times, but it does come. So I wouldn't ever feel that that was that awful, you know, unless music is your profession and that's your life. I, I do have one question that I wanted to ask. We have a HLAA chapter member who had serious and profound Meniere's disease. And he was losing his hearing along with that. And he got a single-sided implant. He got the cochlear implant. And it helped him tremendously. But he still struggled because he couldn't use, he didn't have the ability to put a hearing aid in the other ear that was compatible. And all of a sudden, he decided that he would try a hearing aid. And he, this is after five years or six years of having the implant. And it's working miraculously for him. He's flabbergasted. Does Meniere's burn out? Does it eventually stop? Or what happens? Because he's mystified and he's got us all mystified along with him. Yeah, I do see a lot of times that um, Meniere's can go on for years, but I do see most of my patients that have cochlear implants and as a result of severe Meniere's disease, the flares kind of flame out at a certain point. Um, okay. But that can be anywhere from, you know, five years to 20 years. Um, Meniere's is very debilitating and very, um, with that vertigo, it's, it affects everyone differently in terms of severity. But yes, I do see a point where a lot of these uh, patients, essentially the Meniere's symptoms go away after some time. It's just fascinating to watch what happens to different people within different situations and being involved in HLAA is really, it's really an educational opportunity. That's enough. I've said enough. <laughs> Julie, thank you so much for reminding people about the value of telecoils. Um, I basically generally in my life haven't even needed to use any other devices with my CIs, but I've had two very disturbing funerals that I needed to attend this year. And both of them were so upsetting, even though all of you know me to be a dyed in the wool advocate, I just really couldn't cause any more disturbance, couldn't do one more thing about these and had not used my telecoil in my CI. But since I know about them, I made sure that my, my telecoil was activated in my CIs and in both circumstances walked into the church. And one was this huge church in North Carolina with tall ceilings, carved wood and all this stuff. And there was a hearing loop symbol at the front door of the church. And the minister started talking and the reverberation in that church was so profound because of the acoustics and the shape. I went, oh no. And then I thought, oh, okay. So I pressed the telecoil in my the program and I'm telling you, clear as a bell. I even when I had hearing aids, the telecoil program was not so not as good as that. And the second time it was the same thing. So please, if if all of you are approaching CIs, make sure to have your CI audiologist activate your telecoil. And if you have hearing aids, make sure that you have gone to your audiologist to make sure that you have a telecoil in them or activate it if you can have that. Kathy Rothschild, welcome. Hi, thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation, Kurt. Thank you. Um, I got um, one cochlear implant, both ears needed um, in November and had it activated end of November. And from the beginning, I could understand and comprehend right away. Uh, I was very lucky, but I've had like a transistor radio uh, screeching in the ear and my audiologist has programmed it and programmed it and reprogrammed it and programmed it um, and can't figure it out. And she said, well, you know, just you're, you're hearing things, sounds you didn't hear before. But it, it's like all the time, even when I'm alone and nobody's talking. Um, have you ever heard of that? And I have a cochlear in America's. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times that can be addressed with advanced programming techniques. 
Um, sometimes it's just in the settings. There's various settings with cochlear implant. We can control how fast the cochlear implant fires and stimulates the ear. We can control how um, how big the pulses are when we are stimulating. We can set the loud levels and the soft levels. And so these are something like what you're experiencing is very common in like the first month, two months after surgery. But these things that shouldn't be happening all the time. Now that it's been, you know, you're coming up on two, oh, just over two months, like in the next month or so that should go away on its own. Otherwise, if it doesn't, that's probably some programming that needs to be completed. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if we if we didn't have the procedure done at UCSF, can we still go to all? Could I go see you at UCSF? Um, <laughs> so it's a tricky. Ultimately, yes, we don't encourage people switching between the centers, especially the Bay Area has a lot of cochlear implant centers, and so the general rule amongst the cochlear implant communities, if you're within 90 miles of your cochlear implant center, we prefer that you return to them. But, you know, on a case by case basis, if you want to request a transfer, you can email that um, email that I had on the slide earlier, and you can request to transfer to UCSF. But what we try to avoid is having people bouncing between the clinics. So. Does, are there any more questions? Last call. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Kurt, I just want to say, can I say one thing? Because I know that you're such a huge fan of the T-coil. And I think um, what's, there's something exciting coming out. And the cochlear, the new processor, the N8 processor, which was just released in December, they actually have a new, there's a new Bluetooth coming to the world. It's not out there yet, but it's coming. I think that's starting slowly this summer. But essentially, it's kind of like T-coil-esque, but it's wireless Bluetooth. It's going to be, um, like, say you go to a theater or to an uh, airport. You can go on your wireless device, your phone, and it's like, you know, when you go to places and you want to get on the Wi-Fi with your phone? This is what the new Bluetooth is going to be. You can, like, select, say you're at San Francisco International Airport, you're at ga gate B-17. You can go onto your phone and select gate B-17 when this is available. And what will happen anytime any announcement is coming from that gate, it will go right into your hearing devices. And this is going to be accessible in public on public transit. It's going to be accessible in theaters and at airports. So I think it's going to be something to look forward to in the future. And Cochlear Implant, our Cochlear Corporation already has it embedded in their new processor. And I'm sure the other companies will catch up soon. Yeah. So, Kurt, I sit on the Bluetooth SIG um, group as an HLA representative. And what you're talking about is called AuraCast. Mm -hmm. And to have the infrastructure be in place, it's anticipated that it's going to be at least 10 years for us to benefit from that. So I just want to let you know if you didn't know that, and I'll send you a link about that. Please do, because yeah, I heard that it was coming soon. Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah. So, so if you think of all of the people... So um, hearing loops, telecoils and hearing loops and AuraCast will coexist for a whole long time here. And I know a lot of my patients, I don't know if anyone likes to go to the theater, but the Golden Gate Theater here in San Francisco, their T-coil is wonderful. And like he said, they went to Hamilton and Hamilton's a very hard show to hear for people with hearing loss, right? And a lot of times people will study the lyrics and the plays before they go see them. But he said he could hear everything with his cochlear implants with the T-coil. So Bob always brings us a muffin and we, I have to speed up here. So here's your muffin. And these are cochlear implant resources and we have a YouTube channel so you can um, see them later on the channel. And if you'd like a copy of this slide, I'd be happy to do that. I'd like to remind everybody to, communication access, we need to ask for what you need. And you see, I um, am on the UCSF Patient Family Advocacy Committee to improve accommodations for all of us at UCSF. And this is who you would contact if you would go there or if you needed accommodations and you were having a difficulty. We have some announcements next month. We have a very interesting presentation. It's a social science research um, coming from Stanford, Bryn Griswold, 
in April, we're going to have lessons from Lane County in uh, Oregon on how they are getting hearing loops throughout their city and advocating for hearing loops in March. They walk for hearing in June and the convention in July. We'd like to make sure everybody knows that we have a YouTube channel with most of our presentations. Unfortunately, last month, the um, know your rights, ask for what you need presentation, which is going viral. I'm being asked all by chapters and organizations all over the country to give that presentation. We forgot to record it. Um, we are looking for people on our programs committee. And you know, I'm always looking for some help on the advocacy committee. We're a member organization. Please renew your membership. You can do so online. And here we are, and we have two minutes to spare. We'd like to thank our captioner today for these absolutely fabulous captions. And I'd like to let everybody know that the state of California now makes captions available through to us through our relay service. And this is the first time that we contacted them to do that. And they are free of charge for any event. So I'd like to let everybody know about that in case you didn't know about it. And the captions have been over the top wonderful. We have one minute left. Does anybody have anything, any last thing to say? Kurt, I'd like to really thank you. This is for me the best presenta overall presentation I have ever experienced on having an overview of hearing, having an overview of the implants, just the whole general educational uh, format of it. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I love seeing all these faces in the crowd and I hope to see them in clinic. I actually like seeing without being in clinic, it's nice to actually see people's faces because we've been masked up for now two or three years. So it's been really nice. And I really appreciate you inviting me to come speak. Thank you very much.